Hey folks, the machinery we're working on today doesn't have wheels. We'll get back out in the garage before too long, but as it turns out, there are in fact bad days to be out there, such as the ones where it's 95 degrees. What I have here on the bench in front of me are three Radeon R9 290X graphics cards. We'll call them cards A, B, and C. Back in 2014, this was one of the best graphics cards you could get. Even now, in 2019, they're still serviceable, and you can totally still play games on these. Unfortunately, cards A and B aren't working, but we're going to see if we can fix one or both of them. I've had card C since 2015, and it still works great, but I recently bought A and B from eBay for about $20 a piece listed as broken. Now, card B actually did work once when I plugged it in to test it, but card A produces no picture at all. Given that the problem on card B seems to be intermittent, which is the worst kind of problem to have to troubleshoot, we're going to set it and card C aside and focus on card A. With the heatsink off, we can inspect the top side of the board for physical damage. I don't see anything that jumps out at me here as damaged, so let's flip the card over and look at the reverse side. And once again, if we look at this, I don't see anything on here that looks like corrosion or mechanical damage. Uh, but if we look right here, let me zoom you in on that. If we look right there, we'll notice that we're missing a component. That based on the fact that we've got this row of tiny SMD caps, it's probably another one of these SMD caps like this. We can confirm that by looking right here at card B, which does in fact have one more of those little surface mount caps right there. So we know that we're missing a tiny surface mount capacitor right there on that part of the board. Before we get too much further, we should maybe talk for just a moment about what the components on a graphics card actually do. We have the GPU die here, which is where the processing logic resides, and we have the, mem the memory chips around it, which store the data that the GPU is working on. Almost everything else on the card is related to providing power for the GPU or its memory, or the, uh, the display ports. The card requires several different voltages to be present in order to function properly. And each of these is produced by a section of the board called a VRM, or voltage regulation module. Each VRM produces a specific voltage that the GPU requires to do a particular task. And generally speaking, if any one of the VRMs is not functioning, the card just won't work. Most of the VRMs on the card are pretty simple, with just a handful of components like this one. But most cards have at least one or two that are more complex, with multiple phases and additional control circuits, like this card's V-Core VRM, which is composed of all of these components over here. While that missing cap is a clue as to why our card doesn't work, we also need to check the resistance to ground from the output side of each one of our VRMs. The main thing we're looking for here is unusually low resistance, which would indicate a short to ground. To do this test, we grab our multimeter, and we set it to resistance mode. And then we'll check the output side of each rail for resistance that we know to be in the range of normal for this particular card design. The V-Core rail is the easiest one to test. And what we're looking for here is something like one or two ohms. So we probe from the output side. What we're measuring here is the resistance from the VRM over here through the core to the ground plane. And what we get is about one and a half ohms, which is in the range of normal. This is a fairly complex GPU die, and the more complex and large they get, the lower the resistance is. So one and a half ohms is good there. Next, we'll check our VDDCI rail. Okay, that may be the ground side. And this card has GDDR5 memory, so what we're expecting is a resistance in the 100 to 150 range, maybe. And we get 112 or so. So that one looks good. Next, we'll test our aux rail. And we can also test, instead of at the output filtering capacitors, we can also test directly on this metal casing on these direct fat type MOSFETs, where this metal plating on these, and just like this one, is actually connected directly to the output of the VRM. So this is the, uh, the drain pin on that transistor. And if we test from there, we get 31.6 ohms, 
which if I had to guess, I would say that's in the range of normal as well. And now we can test the other minor rails. This VRM is a little bit different from most of the others on the board in that this is a LDO type regulator as opposed to what's called a buck converter in the case of most of the others. And this one's output pins are right here. And basically the entire VRM is just this one SOP8 chip. So we test there and we get about 200 ohms, which I don't know for sure what the resistance should be, but 200 ohms sounds sane for something that interfaces with the core. And we'll also check this guy. And we get 151. So that too seems like that's probably a sane resistance. So we'll flip the card over and we'll test this one on the back. And we've got 360-ish. So that's probably okay too. So what we've determined by testing the resistance from, in the case of these SOP8 ICs, pin eight is typically the phase pin. And so it uses that to know what the voltage that it's currently providing at any given moment is. So we can test the resistance from that, which is wired up to the output and whatever it powers to ground. And by testing that, we can test the resistance through the load. And what we were looking for is any that read zero or, you know, a hundred million or something, which would indicate either an open circuit for some reason or a short to ground. Given that we don't see those, our next step is that we can plug the card into a working system and power it up and test the output voltage from each VRM to see if each one is present. Okay, so we've got our test system here, and I like to use a riser cable when I do this kind of testing because it means I can flip the card back and forth like this, be able to reach both sides with my probes. So we'll go ahead and we'll plug our card into our riser cable and we plug in our power leads from the power supply. Like that. Now we're ready to power the system on. One thing that we want to do when we start the system up is make sure that the die does not get super hot. So we're going to put our hand on it and wait for a few seconds and make sure that the die doesn't get hot. And if it does, we're going to shut everything down and we'll have to put a heat sink on it or something. But a lot of the time in these situations where you don't have the card starting up at all, you find that the die doesn't get warm at all. And in that case, you can totally leave the system running for as long as you need to in order to check the voltage at each one of your VRMs. So we're also going to plug in our monitor cable. We want that just so that we can tell if we're actually producing a signal here. Got our monitor cable hooked up. I'm gonna set our multimeter to voltage mode. We're going to grab our power switch, power on our, no, oh. make sure our power supply is switched on, power on our system. And I don't have an operating system drive plugged into this, so it's just going to boot up and uh, go to the insert something bootable screen. But currently it's probably waiting on the card to respond, which it's not going to. So. With the system running, we're going to put our hand on the GPU die, and it's not getting warm at all. And that tells us that probably we're not providing voltage to the GPU core at all. And now we're ready to check the voltage uh, being provided by each of our VRMs. So we stick our ground probe, or our negative lead, on ground, and this row of through-hole leads right here are the filtering capacitors for our, our uh, V-Core VRM. These ones up here are the memory rail, VDDCI, and these ones down here are V-Core. So we're gonna test this one. We've got nothing. Gonna test this side. And we've got two millivolts, which is basically also nothing. So we know that that rail is not powering up. If we, I think this side is probably supposed to be the positive rail. 
we've actually got a negative voltage, which means we've got higher voltage at ground than at that one. So we know that that rail is not powering up. We'll also test our memory rail, also called VDDCI. And we've got a couple millivolts there, negative there. That tells us that our memory rail and our vCore rail are not powered up. We'll check this choke. I suspect this is 12 volts. That's 12 volts. We'll, sus we'll check this choke. 0.96. So our 0.96 volt VRM is powering up. And if I had to guess, I'd say this chip controls it. So let's check the phase pin. 3.2. Okay, we may want to check what this actually does. But we do have, if we test that there, come on. There we go. We do have our 0.95 volt rail, and that's running. So we know at least one of our VRMs is good. And now we can flip the card over, and we will once again connect our probe to ground. And we check the voltage at our, this choke, which should be our aux rail. And we've got 13 and a half millivolts, which is well below whatever it should be. This here is another VRM. So we'll check the output pin on this one. And we've got five-ish volts on that one. So that one's working. We'll check the output pins on this guy here. 1.8, so we know our 1.8 volt rail is working. Check this guy. 0.96. Okay, so that controller it's for our 0.95 volt rail. So, what have we learned? We'll go ahead and switch this off now. So what we've learned is our aux rail, our memory rail, and our vCore rail are all not powering up. And for that, we need to figure out what enables each one of those, because I strongly suspect that all of them are probably not bad. All right, folks, we're gonna leave this there for now. The next step in the process is reading the data sheets and figuring out where exactly on the board our VRM inputs connect to. And frankly, that's about as exciting as watching paint dry. So I'm not going to subject you to that, and instead I'm going to do that off camera and I'll explain to you what the process was later once I've figured it out. So we're gonna leave it there and we'll reconvene once I've done that. Uh, as always, if you're troubleshooting your own R9290X, I hope this video helped you out. And if not, I hope you were at least entertained. And as always, I will see you in the next one.